What's up, Steve? Hey. Are you muted? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you now. Holy gotcha. shit. What's up, man? <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm there's... Sam. That's Brian. Yeah, yeah, I know you. I've, I've watched your videos. Cool. cool. And you, cool. Brian. Brian. Okay. And uh, yeah, did you get to see the thing on Saturday with Walter Chow or? I did not because oh. like, I, I just wasn't home. I, actually, yeah, can we just tell me what exactly that was? Because I really wasn't too sure. But I, you know what I love? I love the amount of love that that Miracle Mile, the movie that you directed. Hey, Steve DeJarnett, how's it hey. going? <laughs> so welcome to Red River episode number 71. Um, Glad to be here uh, yes. crossing Red River with you. Yeah. The director, uh, we do, you know, we talk about, you know, movies, music, and pop culture. That's kind of like what we always talk about. Um, and I always mention your movie, Miracle Mile. We, we, one of our earliest episodes, we talked about our fav favorite, like, you know, apocalyptic, dystopian type, like, films. And I always, man, there was, I just, I, I'll get into it. But tell me exactly what that event was that you just. Uh, it, well, it was Walter Chow, uh, who, Film Freak Central, who's a big, you know, highly revered critic. He actually wrote a whole book, you know, 10 years ago, sort of helped the, the big sort of retro revival. And he used to program the Alamo Draft House in Denver and okay. other, you know, all around the Denver area. Sure. Uh, and so it was a thing for the Denver Library. He, he, he had, you know, Guillermo on uh, Del Toro the week before, and they sold out 500 seats. We sold out 500 virtual seats. That's crazy. Last Sunday, nice. there, come on. So he's having, you know, and he's had Edgar Wright on there, whatever. It's, it's a really good thing. Uh, they're, they're archiving it, so you can see it at some point. But, oh, but I still had, you know, the Miracle Mile sign back there. Uh, you can't really see I can't no, see, I see it. it. Oh, I can yeah. see it, yeah. And, and, and the rotating clock thing, although it's not lit up. And, and uh, you know, even though you're doing this audio. And then I had, you know, visual things. I can, I can do Dylan, you know. The pump don't work because the van. Uh, oh my god! Yeah, these are oh, Paul. Wow. These are Paul Chadwick production illustrations that were always in the the script, um, and you know he does concrete uh, the graphic novel now, but like they're yeah, it's getting a weird reflection off there. But oh yeah, I, I we see everything. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so there's nine of these, and then he storyboards the whole movie too, although. And I, I won't give it away because it's like, you know, now it gets serious. Okay. There's Man. nine of them. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, I, we, we could really just totally get into that. But, like, I don't really know too much of, like, your background. Um, and I know that you started, you know, like, your, your earliest credit, I think, was, like, Strange Brew. Um, can you just take us back to, like, there for, for, for a little bit? Just let us know how you got into the, the, yeah, I, I grew up, I'm back in the Northwest at least half the year now in Port Townsend, Washington, but I grew up closer to Portland, Longview, Washington, and, you know, a little logging town. I was mainly a jock, um, played all sports, but then track was my specialty. Yeah. Uh, you used to have the state record in the quarter mile for Washington State. Nice. 47-2. Went to uh occidental college in la didn't know anything about movies i'd only seen movies at the drive-in or tried not to see them and um and friends down the hall had a camera and they went off to these double bills a couple times a week and i just got the disease i got the bug and you weren't I, taking film there you you got there, it on the side there, there, were a couple, there were a couple teachers there there was a documentarian woman chick strand uh who's married to neon park who did Weasel's Rip My Flesh album cover and all of Little Feet's al album covers. Uh, so I used to go watch the Little Feet practice. But um, but yeah, I went there for two years. Then I went to Evergreen, which is up here in Olympia. 
because uh, they had film equipment they, and made some films, went to the AFI, dropped out of the AFI. This is how I got in the business. I dropped out and decided I wanted to make a, you know, film noir detective movie. Took me two and a half years, three DPs, four shoots. But, uh, and we had, you know, Eddie Constantine from Alphaville in it and Timothy Carey from uh, The Killing and Edie Adams, a bunch of, you know, the, the giant from Twin Peaks, Carl Stryken, his first role. So I had quite a cast and it played at Filmex, which was sort of the equivalent of Sundance back then, 1978. Wow. Uh, and Where I was, was born. Was it? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> my career and you were born at the same time. <laughs> and everybody in Hollywood was in the theater to see Marty Brest's 70 minute movie, Hot Tomorrows, uh, which had Ray Sharkey and the Oingo Boingo in it. And um, so everybody was there. Nobody had ever heard of me. And I was the opening band that, you know, you know, it is sometimes at concerts, people go, wow, I like the opening band. Yes, yes. So the next week, 10, and we had the same crew. We had the same DP, same crew. Um, uh, 10 agents called me and I went from being a bus boy in Highland Park, which is now a hipster neighborhood in LA, but it wasn't then, uh, to being a Hollywood director overnight, literally. You know, people wow. offered me, 40 what movies the, to direct yeah what were some of the movies that like inspired you to to like want to do that like at that moment in time like what what was something that you saw that you're like holy shit I, that just connected well, i mean you? probably you know to i mean all of the film noir stuff but chinatown you know basically i wanted to live in chinatown so um uh or in the movie chinatown so i made my own you know it was 35 millimeter black and white with you know we use hard lighting and and old BNC cameras. So it was not like you go out and you shoot something in color and then make it look black and white. So it looked like an old movie, a very you know stylish thing. Um, and I don't know, all the seventies movies. I mean, yeah. I was before that. And actually, actually, as I was making the film, I ran the day, I was a projectionist at BBS with this company that made five, first of all, they made the monkeys. Then they made Five Easy Pieces, Easy Rider, Last Picture Show. So that was my job, going there and running. I'd run Days of Heaven. It was 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 editing there. I'd work in the editing room, and I'd run Days of Heaven all night for Terry Mallet. So that was. And was, that was that was that area like? I mean, obviously, you know, like it's it's like movie town. So was it like magical, especially at that time? It, it really was. There was Filmex, like I said, the best once a year film festival. There was Sherwood Oaks. Experimental College where, you know, Robert Town or whoever would come on Hollywood Boulevard. I went to the AFI. My class was, fellow class members were John McTiernan, you know, uh, Dyard, Ed Zwick and Marshall Perskowitz, uh, Ron Underwood, who did City Slickers, Stu Kornfeld, produced yeah. Elephant Man and the Fly. And we were just kids and we knew, knew nothing. And actually, I was the first one, I think, into the business because I dropped out and made a, a genre film they never would have let me make yeah I, f first of all i was there as a as a writer not as a director so i wouldn't have got to make a movie anyway so i just did it was, on my own was that was writing your first love over directing uh no back then and even i think through through the 80s i wanted to be you know a, a, an auteur i was i was a snotty young auteur you know when and i that's why i turned down 40 movies to direct i wanted to just make my vision and I did. I, mean, I starved. I had all these other opportunities. And then in the, the 90s, I went into television and I became a total hack. And I, sure, I'll do it. Yes. Yeah. And I have like, we, we were actually like, I was going through. So one day, you know, you're pretty active on Facebook. And one day you made a list of everything that you, uh, you know, you're like the list of the, the shows that I did. <laughs> and I made a note of it. I was like, you know, so, you know, truth be told, we wanted to have you on for a while. And uh, I think we had a conversation about it last year. And, you know, it just, I, in a way, I was kind of like nervous because like, it's like you're the director of one of my favorite films. So it was kind of intimidating to basically just be like, you know, we're such a like, you know, like we have our friends, we, you know, like local bands, you know, and like- you, Your band, you're great. I'm more in awe of you than you are of me. Because I, <laughs> right, right now at my, AJ, you're getting up there. I, I still want to start a band. To me, music is the best thing. You know, so I've done sports, I've done, you know, film and television. I the last 
eight, 10 years have been dedicated to writing fiction. And I do want to promote my book at yeah. some point before. But, I have it right here. But yeah, but oh, great. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so and I'm going to keep doing that. I, I, I doubt I'll make another movie. I, I, I have scripts I'd love to get somebody else to go run with. Uh, but, you know, my feet hurts. You know, so I don't want to make it. Let's get there. How did you hook up with, uh, with, with the guys like with Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas? That's an interesting story that isn't well known. I've said it in a couple of podcasts. So, you know, I'm, I'm writing, I, I, you know, at the very beginning, once I was in there, I t turned down a lot of features to direct, but I had writing jobs. And Joel Silver worked for Larry Gordon, you know, who Joel Silver later, you know, made yep. all the, he made all the Joel Silver movies. Um, but he was, wasn't a full, you know, he's the underling to Larry Gordon there. And Joel was going, there's got to be a Bob and Doug movie. There's got to be a Bob and Doug movie. So, and Belushi had just died. <laughs> Everybody does, you know, Joel Silver. <laughs> Albert Brooks plays him in movies and stuff like that. He's a character. Um, Belushi had just died. Rick and Dave were going back on, you know, uh, not SNL, on SCTV. And we're depressed. I mean, everybody in the comedy world was depressed. So they couldn't really tackle it. So they sent a couple scripts, Miracle Mile and this other logging with helicopters like Burt Reynolds thing I wrote. And I got a job. I got hired to go up to Toronto and knock ideas around. And they needed a script desperately. And then MGM somehow had a date that they needed it by. So, you know, we, we kicked ideas around. At some point it was like, the thing of Hamlet in a brewery, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or Hosers A came up and I wrote it in 10 days. I, I had run 12 miles on the top of the building with a blister. And then I came home and I had a blister within the blister and I couldn't walk. So I just wrote Strange Brew. Um, they, you know, fast, man. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're all good, you know, and, and structurally everything's there. Uh, uh, they were always gonna, you know, improv do their thing anyway uh and mgm you know committed to doing it um then they hired me to be the director of it i was hired to direct strange brew and um uh, it didn't last long because mainly because it went as a canadian movie and i was a canadian but you know and, and also i think i had friction with the pr production um people the line producer because i wanted to like duplicate the shining trailer but with beer and they wash up in the camera and i did bring david snyder the art director of blade runner on and he brought stephen poster the second unit dp of blade runner and they directed it and did a great job and you know i have a i have a writing credit on it. and yeah. and i get paid fifty thousand dollars to not direct the movie <laughs> it's a good you know that's it it's a good price you know for not doing something Good if I really hate something, I'll take less. But you know, that's otherwise that's my price. If you want me to not do something, and it's uh, I, it's like a pretty beloved movie too. Like it turned into like, this, like you know cult movie that people still love. That's that's what I am. I'm an '80s cult guy. Strange Brew didn't make any money. Cherry 2000 made lost money. Miracle Mile made its money back. So those are three '80s. You know. Cult things. Miracle Mile actually was profitable. I was, but the company, you know, never pays the profit. So I was owed about 400 grand. Well, um, so yeah. Let, yeah, so let's go to Cherry 2000 then, because yeah. um, that, that came out right before Mir Miracle Mile. I had never seen it. I'd never seen it. And I noticed that it was streaming on 2B TV, which is just like. Yeah. Now, I, I will say, say this Cherry 2000 on Amazon, that's the good looking version. Looks okay. decent. Amazon, the, the, the Miracle Mile version on Amazon is the old sucky version that's formatted wrong. Looks terrible, just terrible. I mean, it's the same movie, you can watch it, but if you're like a, you know, if you care about how a film looks, right, don't right. watch it. Thank you. So and the DVD. Yeah, the Kino Lorber, Blu-ray and DVD, both, you know, we did that. I, the DP, Teo Von DeSante, yeah. Teo Von DeSante and I were in the room and we did that. And um, that looks great. Even the DVD looks a thousand times better than the one on Amazon. I hope they'll run it again. Netflix had it on for a while, and then in the UK. But you know, I don't. I don't know. How. Those guys are so busy; they don't even return your. Um, call. 
so yeah, this was my first time watching Cherry 2000. Really interesting movie. Melanie, Melanie Griffith. Um, I mean, just so you didn't write this one. Um, no, Michael Almereda, who keeps making movies somehow, okay. wrote it. Connie Chubb is a producer. A director, I think Irv Kirshner was getting ready to direct it and fell out. So I had turned down 30 movies. To, I mean, basically, I just wanted to make Miracle Mile. And at, at the time, they, they called me up and offered it to me. I was getting ready to make Miracle Mile on a $2 million budget with Nick Cage. Wow. And if Hemdale was, was in Holland doing the banking, and it was, this is the weirdest day of my life. So the head of Orion, Mike Metavoy, calls me up and says, I'm sending you a script. You got to do this. I think I had a three picture deal with him that they <laughs> forgot about. It. Uh, and I said, No, Nick's, Nick's, you know, turning down everything. We're doing Miracle Mile. Oh, okay. Then within the hour, I get a call from Nick and Coppola's attorney, Barry Hirsch, big, big guy. And he goes, Oh, listen, Nick's going to do two or three other movies. Uh, then we can do your little film. Um, so we'll slot it in in like a year and a half. I go, Wait a sec, Nick. Nick's, you know, said he's turning everything up. Well, that's the way it is, kid. Nick's on Catalina without a phone. Sorry. Yeah. Tried to get a hold of Nick, you know, and it, it was very weird. It was like, Nick's on Catalina without a phone, everybody said. And it turned out that that wasn't really true. So I called up Mike Metavoy and I said, send me the script. I read 20 pages and I jumped on a movie. And it was already, you know, there's already a production designer on it. It's shooting in eight weeks. It's not how I make movies. I prep, I really, you know, know what I'm going to do. Yeah. So we went out there and just sort of, you know, the sets weren't ready for various reasons, weather things. And we shot this and it's what it is. And it's a weird ass movie that has a lot of charm. It's really not like anything else. Basil Paladoris, the score was done in, uh, I forget where, Bulgaria or somewhere. The, it's just a nutty movie. It's great supporting cast. The leads was a bit of a struggle, and we shot in every toxic location in Nevada. It was a really tough shoot. I, I, I look yeah. tough. Yeah, um, I like the the main character, uh, David Andrews, right? Yeah, well, I thought I thought he did a, a great job. Um, he, he does really good acting now, and he did before. He kind of froze up a bit, and Melanie had some issues. So I, sometimes I say I didn't direct them; I refereed them, and I directed the other things. <laughs> but it was, we were also tired. It's just like, okay, we just got to get both people out of their trailers at the same time. And that didn't happen all the time. So you'd shoot one side without, you know, and just difficult stuff. And Hoover that Dam. Hoover Dam scene seemed very involved. Let, what was that like? That They would never let you do that. <laughs> no, sorry. not even. And I was like, they're really there, I think. Yeah. Well, the only... I didn't rewrite the script. I shot the script word for word, but we did need some action sequences. So when we're scouting around, ooh, Hoover Dam, let us shoot shooting Hoover Dam. So we did. And same thing with the, you know, semi-ridiculous magnet picking up the car <laughs> and having an RPG fight for yes. really no reason. <laughs> but, yeah. but other than we need things to blow up for the trailer. That's literally it. Yeah, it's it, I, I actually wish that now, why are we going this way? Well, we need explosions for the trailer. So it could be that kind of space balls wink at the audience. <laughs> I think, you know, so when I posted it, like a lot of the people that, um, that I'm friends with remember the movie. They're like, oh, I would always watch this on like, I don't know, maybe they said HBO all the time. So I think That's people re remember it fondly. Yeah. Um, and it was like my first time watching it, you know, at like 42. And uh, it's funny because you said it's like uh, Planet of the Apes without the apes. <laughs> I mean, I, I must say, I used to disparage it. I don't know because, and I embrace it. And, and I, actually, I love watching it with an audience. It's, but it's like, you know, it is not what I, I and I do credit everybody else. I was the director, but every, a lot of different people are responsible for, for making it, for better or worse. The weird thing is, it was barely released, but HBO used to run it all the time. That's how people saw it. And then it started getting a following there. and. I'm shocked by some of these things like New Zealand, uh, Amp Timpson, who's directing now, but he's a, you know, produced a bunch of good movies. He had a theater. He ran it for six months or something like that. So it's like you had three of like, like some of my favorite like character actors, uh, Tim Thomerson, yeah, yeah. of course, 
Um, Brian, damn. Thompson. Brian yeah. Thompson. No, no, He's... no, 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 no. That's, that's. Uh, oh, oh, Brian, uh, James. Brian James. Brian James. Uh, and then also Robert Zadar, man, Maniac Cop. Like those were like, <laughs> like, you know, that's like my childhood. Yeah. Right uh, well, folks, Sam and, and Brian were in the army together, so they they had a great time. Uh, okay. And like that, remember that Sky Ranch thing out there where yeah. we had the girls in that scene were all Hawaiian tropic girls, and then we had like a ton of stunt people. And I think there was like four marriages or something between Hawaiian tropic girls and stunt men. They just all paired up and got married. <laughs> when was the last time you saw it? What, what, the last time what? I saw Cherry? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I go pull clips from it. I, you know, I haven't seen it in a theater for, you know, a couple of years or something. Like um, when you watch like something like that um, or anything that you've directed, like, do you, do you watch it as like an audience member or just like, you know, like the way I listen back I, to one of my songs? <laughs> I can now, but for a long time, it's like, and I must say, you know, I, I did my cut, they tested it. It didn't test terribly, it just didn't test very good. I remember the film broke four times before it got rolling. So, you know, the, the audience is like in Sacramento, I think it's like really like antsy. Those things, you know, they pill, pick people out of a mall who don't have anything better to do. And oh, then yeah. they decide your fate as a film. And they're just notoriously, insane things to do so you you fly up there we love the film we love it and then on the way back it's, it's a disaster we have to recut it so i did stuff and then um dwayne dunham you know lynch's editor came in and and he tweaked it a bit i wish i wish there was footage for him to do more but you know it's it's what it is it's it's you know <laughs> well it, it it leads us to so man you figure i watched miracle mile which was the movie they came out after I was like 10 years old. And when I tell you at 10, I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy. I thought I was going to live forever. Um, I didn't think anything bad was ever going to happen in my life. Like that's, those are just the thoughts a 10 year old has. Um, I, you. I watched this movie and from beginning to end, like I just, I remember, and I tell people specifically, this is when I realized that we're all going to die. And I was just like, this movie like embedded itself in my psyche and just kind of, because it doesn't have a happy end. Like everything about it was just so fucking like. You, you've seen the happy alternate ending, no? I ha no, I think Brian. I, I did what? Um, yeah, well, I, I watched on the DVD, the alternate ending. It's only two that. seconds long, so. Yeah, the diamonds come, well, did you talk on that a little bit? Um, well, yeah, bring that up. Let's let's continue your yeah, yeah. childhood okay, yeah. So, yeah. that I gave you. <laughs> yeah, um, <I> guess. <laughs> I'm telling you, like it. I I feel like it, it. It made me gravitate towards movies that were more real or things that were like. Um, I guess maybe like in a way, just like skewed my taste to to not want like this like perfect ending. Um, I don't know. Miracle Mile is like one of my favorite movies of all time. It's just, it's unbelievable. I watched it again last night in preparation for this and it still gave me anxiety. Um, the direction, like just everything about it made me feel like, like, like uncut gems did um, like the movie mother Aronofsky's mother is just yeah. insane. The, uh, the, the Safties are, are fans of Miracle Mile. Oh, really? That's yeah. Somewhere on the, on the internet. There's a thing. If you put in Safties and 20, or you know, a midnight or a, from midnight to dawn marathon thing. It ends the marathon. It has after hours, and so there's That's like so six cool. movies uh, that they would program. I, they never did program it, I don't think. But it's like you know, they're yeah. and I, I've only sent about ten tweets, but I think my seventh tweet I was, you know, putting something out about some showing American Mile, and and Benny replied. He said, "Nice tweet." <laughs> and, you know, whatever. So I, I had a tweet returned by yes the, those, those two guys you know they definitely have that uh, uh Abel Ferrara flavor to yeah, them I love Abel too I mean you know, like, bad, bad lieutenant for my favorite oh my god bad lieutenant in King New York for me just like yeah, yeah. 
like just like you know living in 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 on long island close to the city growing oh, up yeah, yeah. manhattan like so that's that's what i i love but um yeah it's just it's one of those movies that i tell people there's two there's a couple of movies there's miracle mile and then there's a movie called the last supper um from 1995 which yeah. is also like an hbo movie like just like miracle mile i would always see last it on supper? Huh. okay yeah the last supper was like um it's 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 kind of like a is it a new thing or is it? it it's 1995. So um, it's it's uh, like this, this, these college liberals invite like crazy right wing people over to dinner. And if they can't change their mind, they give them poisonous wine and kill them. So they're kind of like the jury and an executioner. And it's 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 wild. It's a wild movie. But those are like two movies that I I know that always um, get lost in the cracks sometimes, but the people that love them um, just love them. So I, I always uh, push. I'm waiting for Miracle Mile to start getting a backlash because it's been this thing that people don't know about and then they turn their friends onto. You know, they it's re really important for anybody out there listening. You know, don't find find out as little about it as you can because it plays best if you go in there knowing nothing. Um, but then it, you know, but at a certain point, then more people will see it. And then, then, you know, then just, you know, it happens with bands, you know, they love you when you're playing small clubs. And then when you start playing bigger things, they turn on you. I can't um, wait for them to turn on me then. Well, <laughs> exactly. We, that's what we all like. Uh, and Miracle Mile, when it came out was, um, it didn't, you know, it was about 75% liked it. You know, so it had big, huge fans. And then people hated it. A quarter of the people hated it. Some some of that was because people wanted a happy ending, though. The experience, but other people just they hated everything about. It. They hated the acting. So, and critics too. Now, I think in the revival thing, I've only seen a couple of critics that were trashing. It's pretty well done with it. It's, you know. it's and it was a real labor of love for you. As I mean, yeah, as far as how long you had on the write it and wasn't it when you listed as one of the top ten screenplays? Yeah, that, I'll, I'll I'll rattle through this stuff because it's on the I I've said it on a bunch of things, but. I wrote it, I pitched the idea to Warner Brothers with Tony Bill, who's a producer. Um, I wrote it, turned it in, they loved it, but wanted to put more writers on it. And it was then gonna cost a lot of money. And I was the director, but um, there's a lot of sort of different versions of the story, but this is the way it really was. And I asked for it back because they were, they were gonna mess with it, it was gonna cost more to do it. And you know, they probably were not gonna let me direct it if it turned into a Paul Newman movie or something. So they let me have it back for free. I, uh, uh, then I had to option it for two years. Then I gave uh, that 50 grand from Strange Brew. I gave, after taxes and commissions, I gave every penny to Warner Brothers to own it outright. Otherwise I would have lost it. Um, then I rewrote it and then Warner Brothers offered me four or $500,000 to sell it back to not direct, probably to be the Twilight Zone movie. Not, not a, a segment, but the whole movie, which wouldn't have been a good idea. Wow. I and I turned I that down. And that's like five million today or something. That's like four hundred grand is what Robert Town and William Coley got. So my agent, you know, of course, said, I'm getting you you're gonna be equal to the highest paid writer. And it, and it it had been in the very first thing that's now the blacklist, the very first 10 best unproduced lists. It was in that. And then I starved and turned down stuff and it's up for cherry and this TV pilot Hitchcock thing until um, the movie finally was done and came out in 1989. So, so I spent the eighties. Yeah. You know, so I remember just like um, uh, the, the diner basically right, right after the phone call, yeah. um, the very beginning. And it's funny that you say twilight zone because it really kind of felt like that, you know, like it just, the way Anthony Edwards was acting um, the direction like it really felt that you know i mean obviously i've seen every twilight zone a million times uh and yeah it should have that feel and it's at night and and you know there isn't there's no so there's some big sci-fi writers that, that that love america and i'm always in some ways it gets categorized there's no science fiction in it it's all there's nothing beyond the realms of science in the movie it's, it's it is an apocalyptic movie um but yeah i was definitely going for that and Cornell Woolrich stories and some other stuff, you know, just, uh, but I also, you know, as people who've seen the movie, it starts out as one movie, a sappy 
yeah. 80s yeah. romantic comedy. And then, yes, that phone call uh, becomes another movie. And you're not sure. The whole thing is you're not sure. You're not sure. Exactly. And that's the beauty of it, um, especially as you get further in, you know, like something happens and, you, you know, you know, uh, mayor brings something up and you're like, what? Um, but even the beginning, it's funny that you say sappy because the be the beginning direction when they're kind of like, you know, flirting with each other, the way you directed that intro is so awesome, right? The, the museum sequence, I love, I love yeah. it. I reached out the, the rest of the opening of the, the sort of the montage stuff three times. I mean, I on my own dime, I, I, every dollar I got on Cherry, I put into this and then I went 150 grand into debt. Uh, so, and I still, it's hard to have two people meet and believably fall in love yeah. in a short time that, you know, in an 88 minute movie. Now the original script was was a reconciliation story. It was Harry was Gene Hackman or Paul Newman, you know, trombone player back in town, but he breaks in on his ex after 15 years. So that reconciliation story of the grandparents was the main story. Some people never forgave gave me for changing that. And I, if people reboot it or somehow as a limited series or something, I hope they'd go back and have the old, that dynamic. So, because then you're, you know, you're catching up and finishing your life, <laughs> what little time you have with somebody, you know, from the past. And I think that's a better way to do it. Mainly, I just don't want them to mess with the version that I did. Yeah, and, I mean. And, yeah, so it would, it would be similar, but different and, you know. That would be that would be interesting. Uh, I mean, would you ever welcome like a remake? Well, to oh yeah! In fact, a lot of people talked about it. I do have my old contracts, and I may be co-owner, maybe probably not. But they do have to hire me as the first writer and the first director, so I get a good payday. And I'd like to have some input on who might do it. I, I mean, I think it should be, you know, uh, a woman or, or, or somebody else. It shouldn't be, you know, they, it should be. The, the concept works. You do have to, if you're going to modernize it, you have to have solar flares have taken out or made the the phone system sporadic for months. So pe if the phone system goes down and the internet goes down, it's not political. You're not, it's just something that's been going on. So it can be off for the duration of the movie because otherwise that's a different movie. And, and now now mo moving forward with um, just kind of like, so this movie, I, I feel like, I don't know. I didn't remember that many people knowing it back then, but as time goes on, like, I, I feel like a lot of people are discovering it. So is that kind of what you feel is happening like every 10 years? Yeah, I mean, the Walter Chow thing helped, but, you know, it's really from the Kino Lorber Blu-ray, um, you know, that got out there and people, and then, you know, that so really like four or five years is when it's really happened. And then I remember... Um, I was running, it's not a director's cut. There's like five shots and the diamonds at the end, it, you know, big thing in LA somewhere. And Joe Dante had put it out that the director's cut no one's ever seen is playing. And I got found out that, it, that there's all these fans in France. So then people called me up. I went over to France and it sold out 500 seats in Paris. Same time, same night that like, John Carpenter sold out a show, you know, playing his 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 music, yeah. music, and Lalo Schifrin's there, and it was the night before, after the election, after the 2016 election, so four four years, and it was just, and it was literally like the next day. It's like I don't think this is going to play funny at all. I mean, there's funny stuff, but then there's not. Yeah. But it's like it, that was a freaky experience. And then I met you know these other people and a guy, uh, Serge. Uh, uh, put out Splendor Films, may you know, did a theatrical run in France. I went back in June and I went to like 15 cities all around France and we played it in theaters. And a, and a Blu ray came out in France, Germany, and the UK. And then it's just sort of like, oh, it's, it's out there. So, what was it something like? I mean, you felt so strongly about the script, obviously, for, for so long. Is it kind of like a cool vindication, like years later, that? you know, you were right that it was something special? Yeah, I mean, I, this, it was, it, you know, it was my baby, it was my life. It was, yeah. and I fought uh, to do it my way. I, I'm I'm the one who changed it to the love story, not the reconciliation thing. Nobody made me do that. And 
and nobody, and I was able to make the ending. Now I had no money. So my limitations were making a, even back then a $30 million movie for 3 million. I mean, 3 million sounds like a lot, but you know, you got indie films, you know, two people sitting on a couch cost 6 million sometimes. <laughs> we're shooting all at night, lighting up streets, you know, it, you know, so it was really tough. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure the lighthouse cost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but yeah, go, going forward to like I- into your career, um, before we get to the book, um, there's something interesting, like uh, one of your credits is The Untouchables from the 90s. I, I don't even remember how that happened. It was, uh, you know, I basically, I was offered more movies. I had other scripts, but I, I couldn't put, I couldn't will something else into existence. I did that with this short. I literally willed it into existence with the help of my girlfriend, Wendy, and her family. Put up the money. Oh, always helps to have somebody with uh, has more money than you. Um, but uh, so I was kind of exhausted and I started writing pilots. I wrote 15 pilots for every network and every, you know, and, and it went, you know, whatever I wrote that year was good enough that they, let me write more. Um, I got four of them made. One was about a rock band, Planet Rules for Fox. Oh. Johnny Hawks was in it, John Hawks, and almost uh, Mark what Ruffalo. Was well, it was 95. You didn't see it. I, and I can't, I can send you a copy, but I can never put it out there because the, it was a presentation pilot. So it's a 25 minute version of what would be an hour show. Okay. And the concept, it's, you know, it's about a giant band on top, you know, U2 or, or, Pearl Jam or, or somebody who's kind of polit- you know, political, but I insisted you never hear the band play. So it's about fighting with your brother who's you know sl- falling off the wagon and doing causes and having perks galore, but like pretending you're like saving the world. And, and it was good, it almost got ordered. And I, if it just could have had six or eight episodes in the summer, it would have had a cult following, but... Um, Probably t- by today's standards, it's a little soft. It's not like, you know, high energy, not like, what was that thing that Scorsese did? It was not very good. The vinyl. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just uh, in one season, I think. I'll, I'll, I'll send this to you. I'll send you a link. It's just the soundtrack would cost millions to clear. Uh, so it's like, because yeah, in a presentation thing, just to see if you get ordered, you can put anything on there. But I don't know if I can separate the tracks and ever do anything with it. So it's... So- so like I'm I'm listening to this and like for for someone like me who who writes songs but like I don't have you know no one I don't have anyone to answer to um, but I, I I'm trying to liken it to like just writing songs and giving it to a producer or a record label and you love these songs and sometimes they get picked up or rejected I mean like is that really like the life of a writer Yeah I mean I gotta say the you know the, sort of when people go oh, I see this sometimes. He only made two films and then Hollywood kicked him out. No, I worked more in the 90s up till 2008 than I did in the 80s. And I, I turned down stuff in the 80s. So, I mean, I wrote on X-Files and American Gothic. I directed ER and Lizzie McGuire and this untouchable show with Bill Forsyth, that, you know, in, shot in Chicago. You know. I think I remember that then. Now yeah. that you mentioned Forsyth. Yeah, it was a nice... It, it, you know, I had a project with him once, but so, you know, I just did a lot of stuff. And then I sort of ended up directing Lizzie McGuire. So you're in this business, you are what you did last. So yes. I didn't quite get into the network rotation directing. I was supposed to do a freaks and geeks, but it got canceled. And, and then I did a bunch of lifetime crappy shows and, you know, and you're working and you're getting paid and you yes. get residuals and, and then Lizzie and, you know, I still had some writing jobs, but, it was just getting harder. You, you'd spend six months trying to get a writing job. So I just, I got off the train, literally. I said, I just don't want to take another meeting. If the job comes along, great. Nice. And I got a master's in creative writing. Yeah, yeah. That's and and started writing, you know, short stories, which I, yeah, I really didn't, you know, you know, fiction is totally different. I mean, it's, it's the writing is much more sophisticated. Um, usually a Hollywood screenwriter just takes their script and puts it in a prose format and you know but I, I took it very seriously uh and my first story that I ever sent out got in the best American short stories that book that comes out of you so, I can't uh, pronounce it why my I, why can't well, I... Ru- Rubio Rising 
yeah that but, one. Yeah, yeah yeah um uh, uh and you know it's the shortest one and then you know i've been in the in some other anthologies and uh, you know like i say i'm i'm gonna i'll write some more but i'm kind of taking a break for that and, and i wish there was an M mfa program to start a band why don't you start one because I, I i love music more than anything i can sort of play in my open tuning but I want to really study it and go, okay, what is, you know, I don't know the chords I'm playing and stuff like well, that. I mean, you can play then, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can make stuff that sounds like music. <laughs> drum, okay. I mean, I don't, I haven't played with other musicians that much. I'm just taking guitar lessons now. So I can go, Oh, I know what that is, but no, I, I, I can make, you know, get a groove going. That sounds like something. And, and, I, and I don't, I only have a few pieces left in you know, but 10 years ago, I had a world-class collection of, uh, you know, vintage analog gear. I had a 10-channel sidecar, Helio sidecar. It was part of the Who's Ramport Studios console. Wow. I had Deca compressors. I mean, I had, like, stuff, and, and rock stars used it. I, you know, Queens of the Stone Age used the compressors and stuff like that. I mean, really expensive. So I, I sort of spent... Rather than buying a house, although I, I own this one, but you know, in LA, you know, it's nice. I've got six acres up here. It's cheap up here. This is so it buys a, a, a mailbox in LA. Uh, <laughs> or New York. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. But but you know, I sold all most of that to for other things, and uh, but you know, that was sort of my. I, I wanted to rub elbows with the music people, and pe people knew of me. This guy with his great gadgets. I was a terrible businessman. Usually people rent this stuff for a fortune. And I just like, I don't know if you know Alan Johannes. Yeah, yeah. He plays with, with Queens. Yeah. And then he had a great band, Eleven, with his now, um, his wife, uh, Natasha, uh, passed away. Check out that band sometime, Howling Book. Okay. Uh, um, they were amazing. It's just him and Natasha and Jack Irons, I think. Jack Irons. Um, so sure. I did like this deck of compressor that people, you know, you know, I just, I, I let him have it for four or five years you know, and in charge of money. So, so when, when you play music, like what are some of the records that through your life that inspired you? Like, well, I love everything. I really, you know, my tastes are pretty wide on music. Uh, probably what I'm capable of doing is, is trying to be, you know, guided by voices or something, you know, okay. just, you know, something that has a melody and gu guitars and melody and uh, probably more songwriting. Now, I, I did go through a phase a long time ago, actually, when I was at the AFI, of hardcore country western. I, I hate modern country. I can't stand it. I hate it. The, 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 outlaw, the outlaw stuff. Yeah, the outlaw well, stuff. Give well, me some outlaw stuff. I, I don't want any country act that doesn't show up an hour late, drunk, and pukes on the audience and, and walks off stage and gets in a fight. These guys with their pressed things and their cowboy hats and their light shows, that that's an abomination. It's anyway. the worst. Did you ever watch um, Mike Judge's show on uh, Cinemax? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it, in fact, in fact, one of his showrunners from Silicon Valley, John Altshuler, was a uh, uh, you know PA on Miracle Mile. I, I did write another script that was in the ten best unproduced scripts, the third list, which is set in Nashville in '65 about yeah, songwriters hanging out at Tootsie's, the hardcore thing uh, hair of the dog i don't want to make it anymore i was going to make it with bill forsyth and clancy brown I, I need to pass it off to somebody else you know some Brown's sunday Brown's darling I you love know fancy yeah, well, yeah clancy's great clancy, uh, clancy was in one of my favorite movies of last year um he did a movie called the mortuary collection which was mm -hmm. like a horror anthology and oh. he fucking killed it yeah he's so good he's a very smart guy you know he's from a big prominent Cincinnati family, I think that runs the newspaper, or something like that. But he's he's a great guy. I used to go to Dodger games with him when Cincinnati was playing, and he, you know he would get. The, you know, usually you wear the opposing team's hat. You know, the crowd gives you shit, but you know he's he's an imposing guy. Even. He's an imposing guy. <laughs> Way back from like Bad Boys, remember? Viking. Bad. Or, yeah, he was Viking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was like, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. But he was. Uh, he was in that movie. It came out last year. It's very, very good. I saw it on Shutter. And oh, it, the the promising young woman. No, that one. I, I that one's on my list. Did he, you know he, he's playing a low key fatherly role in that. He's good, but it's not like 
it's very yeah. unclancy like in some ways but it's yeah. well you know what so we, we we were talking about our favorite movies on one of the other okay. episodes what are some of the your favorite movies that you've seen in like the last couple of years oh boy well i like that um you were never really here okay mm. um i mean i think that woman director that scottish woman lynn it's amazing um uh, you know, I love the Tarantino movie. Um, not everybody does. You know, Why do you think that? Out. Why do you think not every? Because I love everything he does. He is like... If there's people who just hate him that they were... And then messing with history. It's just like, no, that film had so much love for movies in it. If you, if you, if you like movies, you can't not like that movie. You, you might think he's an asshole, but you got to separate these things. So, um, so it's for me like we're huge Tarantino fans and I, I, I see everything like the, as soon as it comes out and I remember just watching Once Upon a Time and I was thinking like I don't know I, this might be my le- <laughs> my least favorite Tarantino movie really? well yeah it's 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 different it's it's a very bottom you know I don't know I, I I've watched it about four times now. now I did do one story that he also did famous story and I did a better job than him. Okay. Um, I'll send you the link for that too. I, my first time on a professional set was to do a segment of a, you know, a TV movie with four parts. And I got to direct this famous Roald Dahl story, Man from the South, about lighting a cigarette lighter 10 times or you get your finger cut off. Okay. He'd done the same story without credit. I might add, he, was, he didn't credit, credit Roald Dahl um, in that four rooms or something. So okay. here's my cast. My, my cast, the first time I set foot on a professional uh, set. John Houston, Kim Novak, Tippi Hedren, Melanie Griffith, um, and Danny D. The Paz. Um, and, you know, it's a half hour thing. It turned out, turned into a show. So that, that gave me, from between Tarzana and 78 and 85 when I did that, I didn't direct anything. <laughs> So I, I was just turning things down. So yeah, I proved so that I, I knew what I was doing when I did that. Through, you know, so like what I, through this whole episode, um, you know, one thing that you do mention a lot is all the stuff that you turn down. Um, obviously, you know, once you look back at certain things, were, were any of those regretfuls or are you just well, like? You know, Pee Wee Herman, you know, the script wasn't there. Tim Tim Burton did a great. He owes his career to me since I turned it down. I would turn it into a flop, and then he would have just. He's our next guest. Is he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but mm, and then I was getting, you know, I was doing movie the DB Cooper movie and a Hell's Angels picture that I discovered Mickey Rourke for. Then I worked with him on his boxing movie. So there's, you know, it's not like I didn't do anything but try to get Miracle Mile made, but. But the other stuff didn't get made. And then I turn, did turn down just tons of stuff. I mean, my agent, I had a big agent, Jim Burkus, who founded UTA. We just parted ways because he's going off there and getting me offers and, and you know, four or $500,000 to sell America Mile, doing what he's supposed to be doing. And I'm like, no, I want to starve. So, um, man, Mickey Work is another guy. It's funny, you were bringing up a, a crime dramas before. I, I think his movie Year of the Dragon is one like one of those movies that's just so underrated. Great movie, fucking great movie. Not enough people mention that. I think Dino De Laurentiis produced. Yeah, it's you know it's funny. I was just said on Facebook to me, and maybe it was you, where the Stanley White guy that you know it's, it's based on a real guy. I met him with Mickey once back there. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, but um, yeah, this movie Homeboy when I was gonna it was gonna be. Chris Walken, Matt Dillon, Sean Penn, you know, it's quite a cast. And it got made eventually. The, you know, Alan Parker's DP directed it, you know, six years later, something like that. But it, and it's okay. He's it actually, Mickey's great in it. But, yeah. I got that. He, he had such a, you know, from Barfly to Angel Heart to Year of the Dragon, he had such a great run. And then later on, doing the Aronofsky, the wrestler. Um, this is when I, this Hell's Angels movie. He had only done a TV movie, and I think, you know, what was that low budget movie? So they had all, like two credits. And I went to bat for him to star, to be Marlon Brando in Hell's Angels on the waterfront, you know, the, the lead role. And, you know, and he would have got, got the part. 
but it fell apart after Heaven's Gate. Um, they, they just got rid of the studio, got rid of all their projects. And then I bumped in on, on the street, you know, a year later, right after Diner and Body Heat came out. And he was all of a sudden the, the it boy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For and sure. he went, oh, you went to bat for me. So it's like he remembered, he remembered everybody that turned him down, didn't hire him. I'm the guy that stepped up and won and, you know, fought for him. So I can't, he wanted me to come on board his project and we hung out for like a year and I got to, you know, be in that entourage, which is quite an experience. Nice. Right when he, <laughs> he's, you know, he is the guy on top of the world. So I'm glad I got to, to be there. Um, and I, and I hope he's happy. You know, he's had, a, he's had a tough time. Uh, yeah. lately. You know. He, uh, did you ever cross paths with, a? uh, uh Golan and Globus at all? Any canon? No, no. I have a friend, a good friend. I talked to him today, who wrote about five of those movies. Oh, did he? Yeah, and, it's not Joe yeah, Zito, and, is it? I didn't get to work with with you know, Andy Deutsch, um, and I didn't get to work with uh, Corman. I always wanted to do Corman movies. There, so there. Did you ever see the documentary um, on Roger Corman? He was going to direct the Fantastic Four, and it was like the um, Langan, you remember that? Like where it's like, so the Fantastic Four was being directed by Roger Corman, but it was like this doomed movie. And, oh. oh, did you see it? I've heard the stories. Of, here's here's the story on that. So good. It, they had, in order to uh, be able to do the, re they wanted to retain the remake rights. Yes. They shot it down and dirty, green screens, everything. And the cast, everybody shows up for the premiere. They never did the effects. So you, there's green screens in it. It's like, but you had to do that. So then you had the remake rights. And if you didn't complete a film, there's nothing that says you can't have green screens in the movie. It's just shitty. And it played for one week. It's so, so it's it's up on Amazon. Fascinating. The oh, is it? oh no. my God. It's like, it's the full story and Corman's in it and all. And, and I didn't know exactly why they did it, but they tell you like at the end, kind of like, like the cast didn't know. They're like, no, like that, that was the bizarre thing that you show. Well, I guess Terry Malick, who I love and I work for, you know, does that to his poor actors sometimes that doesn't tell them they're not in the movie anymore. So. Yeah. But, um, now, I know, I think they did Red Harvest, you know, the uh, Dashiell Hammett thing. I think Berto Lucci was going to do that. And they, I think they had to go shoot a cheapo version of that, too, in order to then maintain the remake rates. That's a, that would be a good film festival, they, to remake because they're, they're not even just cheap versions they're like unwatchable versions well i guess uh you know i'm gonna put links up to the book um yeah, and the new website too there's tons of stuff for miracle mile you probably don't want to go on there unless you've seen the movie i think because there'll be all kinds of spoilers spoilers yeah yeah but yeah the the book it, you know through sunday with the promo code capital acre a c r e 25 it's 25% off. But then with the, there's another promo code, uh, PR, my name, Dijarn, at all capitals run together. And it's a 20% off. So, yeah. you know. You sent, you sent me the stuff. So, like, I. I yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you, Rubio Rising, Her Great Blue, Mulligan, those three stories, I think if you like my films, you'll go, wow. You, you know, um, you know, they were in. Big, big magazines, New England Review and stuff like that. Very cool. Um, so nothing else you, you want to bring? Actually, I, I want to say real quick, Guided by Voices made three albums last year, so you, you got to catch up a little. The, that's the thing. I, th I think once I am ready to do it, I'm going to just record something every day and throw, throw it. What's the, best, what's the best thing to put stuff up there? Oh. I'm not going to sell it, you know, if somebody wants to donate. But just, just to oh, have, so it's all up there. Bandcamp? Yeah. I'll send you the link. I'll send, yeah. I'll send you the link because it's it's a way where you like Spotify and the streaming sites. That's cool, but if you want to just go direct to consumer, Bandcamp uh, will let allow you to put your stuff up there, sell your merch, but also like it, uh, it, if people want to pay, yes. Like, well, or I might put up there because then it's like if, hey, if somebody wants to put a baseline on this or something, you know, yeah, it's pay what you want. Yeah. Okay. And, and fucking uh, who was Radiohead was the one I bet I remember one, one of the records. They were the ones that really started that. They're like, uh, just give us whatever you want. And then the fans right. were like, oh, here's five, here's ten, whatever. So that's the more way I've lost money making all these posters and giving them away. 
screenings you know it's a losing proposition but i hear that there's a big shortage of bands right now and it's really a- easy to make a lot of money with just a couple plays on spotify is that true no i'm, I'm kidding <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no hope i mean i got nine cents i got nine cents I know, I know. To me. no it's just it's it's just like i willed myself into a track star a filmmaker a fiction writer it's just like I don't know if I have that much will left, but you know, before my fingers, you know, have the next logical step. Yeah, have, uh, you know, have uh, arthritis. You know, can I just put out, you know, some shitty records? I, I I'm up here from, you know, I, I don't have my Sonics T-shirt. I have a guided, or no, a uh, Godspeed you, Black Emperor. Okay. But yeah, you know, the Sonics, you know, things like that. So is that Teenage Kicks? Uh, the Sonics. No. Right? Maybe I'm thinking. Oh, no. of- they're like an kid. old uh, garage rock band. They're like right? way back, '65. It's just dun 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 dun. It's it's a two chord song or something. It's really uh, cool. They're stuff. famous, but yeah. Well, the the you know the a lot of bands from the Northwest. Some guy Jimmy something. Yeah. Hmm. Did you know that Jimi Hendrix and Bruce Lee went to, God, Jimmy. to the same high school, Garfield High, up here? Yeah, for, real? for real. They, they, well, uh, Bruce's girlfriend went to Garfield High and Jimmy went there. So like two superstars, best ever at what they did, same high school, left the country to become, you know, international things, died. Right. Each one I'm not going to Google it because we, we don't have to worry about fake news anymore. So I know. Well, it's, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty true. It's a little okay. off. But yeah. OK, thank you so much. And yeah, yeah, thank I'll, you I'll, for I'll joining you us. Awesome. And I'll send you some links to Remind me to send you some links to some of these. Yeah, I'm going to put this up Monday and, and you know, okay. so. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good. Okay.